and show fear of God. Questions, who do we choose to serve? God or the things of this world? Proverbs 1, 7 begins with declaring the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. According to Strong's Concordance, the word fear is the Hebrew word yira. That's, the, that's capital Y-I-R-A-H, yira, which means fear of God, respect, and reverence. The reverential fear and respect of God is the beginning or the starting point of knowledge. Before we begin anything, seek God. Before we start a career, seek God. Before we begin a business or start a new venture, choose to seek God. Choose to revere God's word and he will direct your pathway. When you and I choose to exalt and revere God, we are placing more weight and authority in his way or doing his way of doing things. When we establish our foundation in God, we are literally placing our hope, confidence, and trust in him. The beginning of success begins with our reverential fear, honor, and respect of God's blueprint, his word. Think about it. Strong's Concordance states that the Hebrew word for knowledge is daath, that's D-A-A-T-H, which means skill, discernment, understanding, and wisdom. The starting of our talent, skill, gift, discernment, and ability starts and ends with God at the focal point. The word knowledge in this context alludes to the comprehensive understanding of a matter. In other words, wisdom. James 1 verse 5 states, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. In order to ask for wisdom, understanding, skill, and insight, we must start with having a reverential fear of God. He is the starting point. Amen. Amen. A mission story. I'm our mission story this morning is entitled A Surprise in Sudan. And this mission story comes from Sudan, located in East Central Africa, and is told to us by Glenn Mitchell, a Seventh day Adventist who worked for ADRA. Some days the temperature there was between 102 to 108 degrees from May to September, which called for a cold drink on days that hot. When asked by his wife what he wanted to drink and when his favorite drink wasn't listed among the ones she named, two hours later, a friend pulled up into their driveway and brought a box filled with things that they needed badly from the United States like shampoo and et cetera. When Glenn opened the box, to his surprise, he found a big bottle of his favorite drink. He never asked anyone from the United States to send it, but God cares about even the smallest parts of our lives. And so God loves to give us good gifts to his children. And Psalms 3410b says, but these, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. So trust God and go forward in faith. The end. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your knowledge, your wisdom, and your understanding of your word. As you help us navigate this life, continue to teach us truths from your, from your word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, Sister Johnson, the will rails can take over now. God bless. Okay. Thank you, Sister Wheeler. Mm -hmm. um, good morning. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, New Hope. Good morning, listeners. Today, our, our lesson is the law as a teacher. And I every time I heard law, I thought about why are there so many contentions about the law? And the only law is the law of God. And when we zoom in, the law that's always contentious is the fourth commandment because people want to do what they want to do so they've found justification to not do 
a buy. But what, what I found interesting is that no one ever questioned the laws of motion or the laws of gravity. And these are derived even though the, the intricacies of these laws are made by God. These laws are, de are defined by men. We accept them, we apply them, we go by them. Yet, when it comes to the word of God, there's always some contention about the law. So today we have the law as a teacher. And as we have teachers here, we know as students, we go, we go to class and we expect to learn from the teacher. We expect the teacher to know more than what we do, we do. And therefore we listen and the instructions that we are given, we apply because we believe the teacher has learned and have that understanding. So as we start today, let us start with our memory verse. Um, if it's available, you can post it or otherwise you can we'll read. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5 reads, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Thank you, Brother Sergeant. So as and so as 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 the lesson said, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So give it all to Jesus. Give it all. Love the Lord with all your heart. But it, so the opening, opening part of our, our lessons reading, it says, in warning the Galatians against legalism, Paul wrote, for if there be a law given, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. And that's Galatians 3.21. Of course, if any law could have given life, it would have been the law of God. But as we go further, we realize the law does not give life. But it is so interesting that God says faith. Faith in him is the only thing that give us eternal life. So can you imagine for a moment if we were able to do works by abiding by the law. We are focused, we're gonna abide by the law. And so we achieve salvation by our works. Imagine when we get there, what would we do? We would be boasting, right? And because boasting is pride and God hates pride, we would fall right back. So we have to start over again. Right? So God said, listen, I'll do the heavy lifting. Just be obedient. Believe what I say. I'll take care of it. You know, because it's just your faith in me, which would lead to eternal life, not the works that you do. Sister Johnson, do you have any comments here? If we're gone. Sister Johnson. Uh, you're mute. You're on mute. Unmute. Okay. Yes. Um, well said, sir. So Jesus, as you said, bears the brunt of it, and all we have to do is to follow. There is a song that says, My Lord knows the way through the wilderness, and all we have to do is follow. We get the easy part obey and live. Disobey and die. <clears throat> Sister Johnson. So one of my favorite, favorite, favorite verses in the Bible is Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27. And that reads Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. 
Okay, so we'll notice here who is giving the new heart, God, right? Who is, who is causing you to walk in this statue? God. What does a new heart do? It causes you to walk in, in his statue. So when we hear this contentious debate about faith and works and faith and works, what we need to understand, we do not do work to be saved. We do work because we are saved. Because what that, in, less, that verse scripture just said, when I put that new heart in you, I will cause you. So it's not even, I cause you. So you, so it stimulates things within you to do good works. So you're not gonna have that heart and sit and, and not be obedient to God. And being obedient to God, you're gonna express love, kindness, caring, helpfulness, you know. So this is, so when I, you know, when, when we mentioned about legalism and the discussion, we shouldn't even really have to have a discussion and a debate about, you know, works and faith. Because, you know, we walk in like Jesus, Jesus is faithful, Jesus did work, right? He did good work and he was faithful because he was faithful to his father. So we'll turn to lesson on Sunday. Oh, Sister Johnson, any more comments before? Can I, can I make a comment, Elder? Or another comment, it's a question really. Can I say then, then that, that law keeping without Christ is legalism? Yes. Can I use yes, it sir. as a definition? Yes, sir. Yes, right. sir. Yes, right. sir. You think you, can, you think you can attain it without having that relationship with Jesus and with God. Okay. And you know we can't do it. <laughs> All right, thanks. Sister Johnson, any No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. We can All go right. on so to we, Sunday. We can right. go on so to we Sunday. We go to Sunday. You, you want to take a lead with Sunday, Sister Johnson? Okay. <clears throat> now, Sunday is talking about to love and to fear God. What is it to fear? We hear the word fear. And um, how do we apply it to, to, to God? Thinking about respect and honor and reverence. Let us look at Deuteronomy 31, verse 9 to 13. What does it mean to fear the Lord? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Brother Light, can you unmute? You unmute. Yeah. yeah. That, that was a lot of reading to read over. Uh, <laughs> you, you want me to do it for you? <laughs> go right ahead. Go right All ahead. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, yeah. So Deuteronomy 31, verses 9 through 13 reads, And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi. I think something here blocking my... my uh, Screen here, one second. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord and unto all the elders of Israel. Verse 10 And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God. Sorry about that. I just got a phone call and it came in on my. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Give me one second, please. Sorry about that. It came in on my computer and, and just threw everything off. Bear with me one second. All right. So from verse 11, when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. 
can't believe somebody will keep calling. Sorry about that. Uh, the place which ye shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and the fear and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. And that their children which have not known anything may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as he live in the land whither he go over Jordan to possess it. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Now, <clears throat> every chapter and every verse of the Bible is a communication from God to men, all men. And it is interesting that the, the instruction is to gather everyone, gather the whole family, parents and children, and even your visitors, stranger that is in within your gates. So if someone comes to visit you, it is your responsibility to share the word of God with them. And this meant that God was intentional in the way that he, he, he gave his law to Israel. <clears throat> He, he, he made every effort so that the law would not be forgotten. He made every provision so that people would have access. He said <clears throat> to impart all of this knowledge to every man, woman, and child. And, and, and we should bind its precepts as a sign upon our hands and a frontlet between our eyes. And if you study and obey the laws, God would lead you as he led Israel by the, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of um, fire by night. So let me give a little um, attention to parents. Parents should interest your children in the knowledge of the word of God. But the first thing as a parent, you must be interested first before you can um, interest your children. Okay. So you want people, or the intention of the law is for people to love God and to fear God. Can you love and fear at the same time? And God wanted this to happen, for you to love and fear. They all go hand in hand. So you, there's a parent who loves a child. Most all parents do love their children. And um, yes, you understand if you do wrong, you will have consequences, but also you are encouraged to do the right. So it is not contradictory. Love and fear is really not contradictory. They work hand in hand. Fear is giving infinite attention to the greatness of someone, the awesomeness of his presence. So there are things that you would refrain from doing in the presence of someone who you have great respect for. Mm -hmm. And also you would honor that person's um, wishes. You would honor that person um, desire for you. So you honor the law. You keep the law out of love and out of fear and out of respect and out of acknowledgement to the creator, to the one who creates you. God wants you to, wants us to recognize his divine presence and, and a, a, a reverent spirit um, must be kept at all times to acknowledge and revere the power of God. So the law is, is nothing but a transcript of the character of God. And one thing, let's remember this, the person who gave the law which is God, Jesus, that's the same person that gave the Sermon on the Mount. So in 
in one instance, he was giving a precept as to what we should do. And on the Sermon on the Mount, its principles. So let us look at God's intention for us and to see how he wants us to follow him and to see how he wants us to love and fear him, not to be afraid, but to love and respect him and what he has to say. I have a comment also, if you don't mind, as uh, what uh, Sister Johnson just made reference to, especially the Sermon on the Mount. Um, my question first is, which comes first? Is it love and then reverence or reverent fear, or is it the reverse? And the reason why I ask the question, or do they come together? Or do they, you know, are, are, they, are they something that comes in a package that's inseparable? Um, as a lesson is talking about education, right? That we must teach our children and something that the author mentioned that you first have to teach them, right? You gotta let them hear. Mm -hmm. And as you, you just rightly said, the parents can't give what they don't have. So if themselves are not even vested before they can go to their children and teach them, <laughs> then it, it, it comes up to nothing. But the children have to first hear the Bible verse that says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then a knowledge of God brings them into that kind of reverence. So my question again, is it love that shows up first, then reverence, or is it reverence first before love, or is it a package deal? I, I think it's a package. Um, if, you, if, if you desire your children to love and reverence God, let, let's say your, ch your child, you as the parent need to be talking about God's goodness, his majesty, his power revealed in, in, in the works of creation. So it's something that um, you will be doing all the time. So listening to listening your children, listening to your children and, and communicating with them and, um, and bringing the word to them, you expect that it will invoke love and also reverence. Oh dear, um, we, 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 we didn't know that God was like this. And so it, it's, hardly, it's hardly inseparable. They come to love you, think of you as a parent. They come to love you at the same time, they respect you. It's hardly inseparable. I don't know what else you, you may want to interject here. Yeah, may I, may, I, may I interject here? I, I totally agree because even though we focus on the children, let's think about is, is your reverence for God as a parent and your love for God and your children while you're going to let them teach. So teach they here. And as you said, Brother Marison, he said they learn to fear, but learning now is opening up the understanding. And as you open up that understanding, then it comes back. You learn now, oh, God is awesome. God is wonderful. So now I learn to reverence him. So yes, I agree. It's a package. And you know, the other thing I would like to add, if we notice in, in the lesson that we read, it said every seven years, which is seven is completion, right? So you're going back to the cycle for completion. Because just imagine. What if that link is broken? So here's a home. The parents didn't teach about God. So that child grew up and that cycle didn't take place. So the child leave didn't know anything about God. So that child start a family, right? And say that child didn't, because you didn't learn about God, then you start a family. Then that, those grandchildren, which are children, know nothing about God. Right. And the cycle continue. And you see, you keep drifting further and further away. So yes, that love and that understanding that reverence, it's that package that we have to um, apply. 
Yes, sir. Okay, we can go on to Monday. Right. So, so we go on to Monday. And it says the law, a witness against you. Mm -hmm. And that is not something we like to hear. Somebody witness against us or, you know, there's something, everything I do, there's something. But if we, if we look at the law in its, let's say, simplest of form, it is a light that shines in the darkness that illuminates our surroundings so we can see where we're going and that we are not trapped. Um, when the psalmist say, your word is a light, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, or is the other way around? It's two, th two ways there, because one, I have a path I need to walk. So that light is to see that I don't get into the obstacles, the holes, the traps that's there. But it also, as a light, it shows me where to go. So it's, it's doing two functions. It's saving me in two ways, directing me in the right place, and it's saving me from falling into the holes or the, you know, stumbling into all these boulders and stuff that is in my way. But one of the, the more interesting thing about um, this is it says, teach the children. And I'll ask you guys, why the children? Well, um, they are the future generation and they are going to carry on your work. Yeah. And the children represent the family. So whatever the child does, and it might not sit well with most of us because not always, but most often it reflects the family. It reflects the values of the family. And you teach your children, you expect them to teach. It is likely that they will teach their children too. Amen. So it, it, they are the, it's like you pass a torch mm -hmm. and they just go with it. You are going out they are taking up the torch. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what I recognize, um, Elder, real quick, and I know I see um, Brother Lloyd too itchy because this, this is a sweet, sweet round. Being that I'm a teacher, so I understand. But um, I have two aspects. Um, they're the, they're, you know, they're the earliest onset of, 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 of human life, right? Um, they're like blank slates. <laughs> and, and, and you want to make certain that, that, you know, as they're coming up, you know, the, the devil himself knows that he, he, if he can get to them before you do, he can make them into his ministers. Oh, you understand? Lord. So they're, they're malleable. I've learned from the age of zero in the womb, a child begins to learn. The most impressionable moments are in the womb. It, it forms mental pathways in the brain just from uh, the beginning, and, and, and is, 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 is uh, David who said it <laughs> in my mother's womb <laughs> was I conceived, and you must understand the, 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 the grandiousness of what David's really saying, right? Most educational system or religious educational system make it their business to promote uh, education towards children because if they can impart to that child the religion they become a faithful follower of that religion in their adult age. Mm -hmm. Imagine, you ever heard the phrase, you can't teach old dog new tricks? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't mean to be me when I say that. But, but you understand the, 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 the import from it. So mm -hmm. these tender creatures, you know, I've also learned that the only God that a child will know is the God that they see in you. <laughs> so... Mm -hmm. If you're not manifesting the true God, children will come away and being a father of four of them. My Let, let's, let's look again. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah brother, brother. Yeah, sorry, my Jim, behavior, my, my, all of that type of stuff would, would come on. I, I, and I'll pause, sister, and let you go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, sister. I, I was just thinking again of the topic of witness against you. So it's... It's also, we can look at the witness as also evidence, proof 
-hmm. you know, and not so much against you, but you don't have any excuses because okay. here's the proof. Mm -hmm. God, God, God um, instruct Moses exactly what he should do in writing the law. Mm -hmm. And Moses knew that he was going to be off the scene in a little while. Mm -hmm. And he, he knew what was going to happen to the Israelites. They were going to fall prey to, 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 to the, 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 the alluring things around them. Mm -hmm. So his chief concern was to make sure that they have the law available at hand. So he told them, put it next to the ark. It's an evidence. You can't say you don't know where to find certain things. It's right mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So as much as it is a weakness against them, but it was, it also served as evidence. And I give you one story. If you go into the hospital and you, um, they give you a lot of policies and papers and things to sign. You don't even read it. It is placed in your chart. And actually, if something comes up, you can't say you didn't see it or you didn't know because here's the evidence you signed it or it was given to you and here it is. So again, the children of Israel had no excuse. Um, Moses spoke of the book of the law and it was like a living being with power. And the aim was to reprove the hearts of men. Here is the blueprint. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is the evidence. Amen. Amen. All right. So let us look at Romans 3, verse 19 to 23. Thank you, Sister Johnson. Romans 3, verse 19 to 23. All right, Romans 3, verse 19 to 23 reads, Now we know that what thing, whatsoever, whatsoever, what things, sorry, what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the knowledge of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short, of the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. So by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be saved because we have all broken the law by sin. But the scriptures always also say Christ gave us that robe of righteousness. Yes. His robe of righteousness he put on us to cover us, to shield us. And this is why it says it's a gift. It's yes. not something that you can boast about. Because in his love for us, he covered us. So, mm -hmm. so if I may mm -hmm. say that the righteousness that God gives us is separate apart, separate and apart from keeping the law. Yeah. Right. And throughout the whole scriptures, the prophets bear witness to, to that. Yes. That righteousness is found in God's own son alone. And, and, and he gives it to, to anyone whose faith rests in him. Yes. Amen. 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 So as time, we're closing in on time. So let's, so Sister Johnson, you want to take Tuesday? Okay, so that you may prosper. Yeah. Um, let's look at Joshua 1, 7 to 8. Joshua 1, 7 and 8. Joshua 1, 7 through 8 reads, Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according 
to all the law which Moses thy serve, my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and thou shalt have good success. Okay, so what is the prosperity that is, um, is spoken of here? If you'll be willing and obedient, according to Isaiah 1 verse 19, you will eat of the good of the land. You will, you will be prosperous. So God told Joshua that just be strong and courageous. Do all that is according to the law that Moses told you to do. Keep a straight line. Do not deter to the right or to the left so that you may prosper wherever you go. And uh, um, there are several interpretations of prosperity. Yes, you, we have to meet certain criteria to, to keep our jobs or to keep our career. So yes, Prosperity is in order there. But the real prosperity that is, is comes what through God, what God gives us in, in, in God's eyes, the success or prosperity comes by obedience to the law. We get confirmation from God. And we are not on our own to do whatever we want to do or whatever we want to choose. We are called to be representatives of God. Obey and live, disobey and die. So turn not, we are, we, we, we are brought with a price as chosen sons and daughters. And we should be obedient, acting in accordance with the principles of his character. So there are outcomes and there are consequences you for obeying the law, for disobeying the law. For obeying the law, there are outcomes. Now, to obey and live, disobey and die. And disobey and die means not only physical death, but eternal death. Obey me, obey God, and keep the law. So you will have, this is what God says, you will have protection. And that is what they told the, the, the children of Israel. If you, if you obey and keep my law, you will have protection and live in peace and safety to the land where, 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 where I'm taking you to. And and um, it, it, it manifested when the, the, um, the children of Israel went to Canaan and followed the, 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 the way of the Canaanites and what happened to them. They were destroyed. They, 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 they followed the gods and um, the idolatrous worship and then they lost, they lost their relationship with God. So, Right there, they, they, you wouldn't call that prosperity by no way because they didn't inherit what God wanted them to inherit. So they lost their prosperity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else anyone wants to add? So then I wanted to ask a question. Um, the understanding of prosperity in the Old Testament uh, people, is it similar or is it the same for us as New Testament followers of Christ. What is that prosperity for us today? From, yeah, um, it is the same because it has, it has to at first as it's vertical. So that connection, whatever you have on the horizontal plane, 
must be directly connected with what you get from the vertical plane, which is your relationship with God. And if you think about that, um, Jeremiah, I think it's 17 verse 11, which says, as the partridge sitteth on this, on this egg and hatcheth it not, so that he that got wealth and riches by right will leave it in the middle of the day and becomes a fool. Literally what, you know, that is saying, you, if, you, if you did not get it fairly and God did not give it to you and you abuse others to get this materialism, it's nothing. You, you're not going to enjoy it, irrespective of the pretense and what's going on. You may be thinking that you're enjoying it, but you're leading to destruction. To me, it's the same because God hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. And that is the same relationship. He wants you first to have a relationship with him. And he also, he will, and he promised you, I will do this. But this is the first thing, you know, because that is why Jesus asked the question, what does it profit a man to gain the world and to lose his own soul, mm -hmm. right? It shows you where importance must lie. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you, Brother Morrison, if we maintain that relationship with God, we don't have to worry about anything in this life. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, so though temporal things may, may be involved. Yes. Well, but the, the, the true essence of our walk, and um, we're being told we've got five minutes, mm -hmm. um, is really the spiritual wealth. And it, the, the, the lesson quotes Hebrews, to let it, letting us know that it's not what we count here, but really what we stack up there. The other yes, side of, Amen. of faith. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It, it, is, it is the promise of eternal life. Yes. On condition of our fidelity to God yes. and the law. Amen. Amen. The other thing I want to comment here, because is when, you know, Joshua's instruction, turn not to the right, turn not to the left. So we could say he has such a narrow path to travel to be right. And remember, Christ said, "Straight is the straight is the gate," which is S T R A I T, a narrow, a narrow body where you can go. Right. So it is is the same thing to say. The other part that I found interesting when I studied this, this book of the law should not depart from you. Now you and I know. Keep it in your mouth. Let it come out. That simple means we have to learn it. But how can I learn the Bible and be able to know everything so that as I go along? Then, I, then when I was think, asking myself the question, this verse came to me with, with God promised that the Holy Spirit will bring things to your remembrance. So all we have to do is um, learn it, commit it, and then it will come back to us at the right time. Um, God, I had told Moses to tell, to, to, to teach them in a song. You know, you're teaching children something and you're teaching them the timetable and you want them to remember it. You start it, you do it in a song. So it becomes, it, it, it goes from generation to generation. Okay, this little song, I wash my hands this morning so very clean and bright. You're teaching a principle. You're mm -hmm. teaching dutifulness to God. So putting it in a song here as Moses did was one way so it could pass from generation to generation and what you would say, rivet in your mind. Amen, amen. As they so say. Going, you see, moving from prosperity now to go into toils and struggles of mm -hmm. the law keeper. So it's not always an easy road. You are being vilified sometimes and because your life is a rebuke to others you will become a, 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 a sore point. And also you get, you get, you get things come your way like sickness and, 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 um, and death and all the other things, evil things that Satan himself has engineered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so Satan is not gonna, let up on you, right? He's always there to make sure the struggle is theirs, but we just need to know that we have to hold on, you know, hold on. Um, we are up for time? Okay. 
So we have one minute. So Sister Johnson, you want to just wrap, wrap up? We have a minute. Okay. So as we contemplate this lesson, the law and, and, and um, our responsibility to keep in God's law. So instead, sometimes we have to think about, not think about our discouragement, but just think of the power that you have at your disposal that you can claim in Christ Jesus' name. He's the only one that is going to be able to keep the law. And remember, he kept the law. He said, he, he said, I think it was in um, Luke, not Luke, yeah, Philippians or one of those, that he, he followed the law. He kept his father's commandment. He abide in his love. I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So as human, as Jesus being human, he did that to show us that we can do that. Through him. So if we want to be overcomers and there's a lot of struggle and we have to admit that. Revelation say that the, the, the dragon was wrought came to make war with the remnant of, of our seed, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So know that the devil is going to come to you and he's going to say, it is impossible, but we can do all the things through Christ which strengthens us. It is a gift and we have to ask God for the gift of grace and the gift of faith and claim by faith the power through Christ to obey God's law. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, team. Thank you. So it's, it's now time for our announcements. So prayers, we're still requesting prayers for Sister Wilhelmina Leach, who continues to not do well. Visits can be arranged by calling Danny or Priscilla Leach at 404-458-3638. And her address is 2425 Candler Road, apartment K1, Decatur. Keisha and Jordan... And for all the well wishes. The date for church reopening, as you um, realize, has been postponed. We are working together to prepare for a safe and joyful return to God's house, so please stay tuned. The 2021 planning calendars are still available for pickup at church today from 11 to 2 p.m. And also the new Quarterlies or fourth quarter are available for pickup today as well, same time. Wednesday night prayer meetings continue at 7.30 and we continue to discuss the Great Controversy, Chapter 18, An American Reformer. Please join us as we review the early Advent movement and become established in the present truth. And the link to that is on office suite meeting and the link is attached fasting and prayer church members are encouraged to continue to fast and pray every wednesday focusing on covid 19 the west coast fires world conditions our relationship with christ and our readiness for his soon coming community services if there is if there is anyone in need, please contact Nablet Forrester and her number is 404-660-2618 to schedule a pickup. And remember, our regular basket distribution is tomorrow from 11 to 1 p.m. On upcoming appointments and events, next Sabbath, October 24th is Pathfinder's Day. Also on upcoming, um, we've been asked to announce Atlanta and Huntsville NCU alumni chapter 
is presenting their alumni day and they'll be discussing resilience and um, you can join and the times are attached to this flyer. Our speaker will be Pastor Glenn Samuels from West Jamaica Conference. October 31st at 11 a.m. will be Pastor's Appreciation Day and it will also be Children's Sabbath. So please join the children as they discuss God is always God is with you always. There's a called board meeting on November 1st at 10 a.m. and the Zoom details will be provided. November 7th is Seniors Day. And Men's Week of Prayer is November 15th to 20th and they culminate with Men's Day on November 21st. Please join us. Thanks. Have a great Sabbath. In a world of many choices there's a call of many voices when they all reach out to greet me. I turn my eyes to thee, for I found in him loving friend. He's with me till the very end. Yes, I found in him a faithful guide who calls me his very own. And I'll choose you again and again. I'll choose you again and again. You mean so much to me, dear Lord. I'll choose you again. I'll choose you again and again. I'll choose you again and again. You mean so much to me, dear Lord. I'll choose you again. In a world of many choices, it's a call of many voices. When they all reach out to greet me, I turn my eyes to thee for I found in him loving friend stays with me till the very end yes I found in him a faithful guide who calls me his very own and I'll choose you, Lord, again and again. Because you mean 
means so much to me, dear Lord. I'll choose you again. I'll choose you again and again. I'll choose you again and again. You mean so much to me, dear Lord. I'll choose you again. I'll choose you again and again. I'll choose you again and again. You mean so much to me, dear Lord. I'll choose you again. Oh, I'll choose you again and again. I'll choose you again and again and again. Cause you mean so much to me, dear Lord. I'll choose you again. Thank you, Jesus. You mean so much to me, dear Lord. I'll choose you again. I'll choose you again. Thank you, Brother Marcel, for that wonderful song this morning. I greet you once again, my brothers and sisters, from the house of the living God. We serve a sovereign God who is still in charge of our affairs on the earth. Never forget that. God is in charge. I want to speak to you once again from the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation chapter 10, we are going to look at the subject, the bitter and sweet experience. Let us pause for a word of prayer. Our heavenly father, we just wanna thank you for your leadership, for your guidance, for helping us to navigate our lives through a complex and confused world. Be with us today, open our hearts, open our understanding so we can capture what you have for us. This I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we will try to help you to see today as well as hear what we are going to share with you uh, this morning. We sort of have a PowerPoint presentation to share with you. Yes.
Okay. Well, as you can see, we want to help you to see what we are going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about the bitter and sweet experience. Okay. Okay, so we're going to be looking from, we're going to be taking our message from the book of Daniel and Revelation. As you can see now, the books of Daniel and Revelation are one. One is a prophecy and the other a revelation. One, a book sealed and the other open, and you can find that commentary in uh, the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7. And so listen, it says here, Daniel 12 forms an important background to the prophetic vision in Revelation 10. Description of the angel, the reference to the angel's oath and the little book or scroll form the connecting links between the two chapters. In both places, the content ascribed to the little scroll have to do with time, T-I-M-E. Daniel is instructed to close and seal the book until the end time. John writes with reference to the time of the end, indicating a correspondence between the two visions. As you can see in the picture, we have an angel. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 10, we have an angel there. And I'm going to read Revelation chapter 10 and verse 1. The Bible says, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. Then in verse two says, and he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. Now, I mind you, I want to remind you that this book is really a book of symbols. You must remember now that the book of Revelation is a symbolic story in chapter 10. Okay? And so, and we know that by reading in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter one and verse three, let's go back to the book of Revelation, if you don't mind, Revelation chapter one, and let's see what the Bible says. Revelation chapter one, it says here, and verse one, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John, the Bible says. So we see here, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ has never left his church. Jesus is always in touch with his church. As you can see on the screen, the book of Revelation is symbolic. It was sent to show Jesus' servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he signified it. And the word signify means to show by signs and symbols, according to Acts of the Apostles, page 500 and 
83. Now, who is this mighty angel that has come down from heaven with a little book or a scroll in his hands? Who is this particular character standing on the earth one foot and one foot on the sea? These are symbolic terms, okay? Because we know based upon the book of Mark, our book of Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, all power is given to Jesus in heaven and in earth. So then when we looked at these various verses in Bible commentary, this, this angelic being is a messenger and this messenger is none other than Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter one and verse 19, it was Jesus who told John to write the book of Revelation for the purpose of sending it to his servants or the church based on Revelation chapter one and verse 11. John 8, 12 tells us Jesus leads his church or a group of people who have made a decision to follow him. Now, I wanna share with you what Jesus says in the book of Matthew chapter seven and verse 24. So if you have your Bible, let's go to the book of Matthew. Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew chapter seven and verse 24. And listen very carefully to what the Bible says. The Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter seven and verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Listen to me very carefully. The rock. Wise people who will hear the words of Jesus. That's what the Bible says. Let me read it again. In the book of Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. The Bible says, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and then chooses, the Bible says, to do them, then Jesus will liken that person as to a wise person which has built his house, his life upon a rock. That word rock stands out. Listen what the Bible says now, very carefully. In Matthew, the same book, chapter 16 and verse 18. Math, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Listen what it says. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want you to jive the two verses together. People who are wise, if they would listen to the words of Jesus and choose to build their lives on the word, he likens him as to a wise person who built his house upon the rock. This rock in 724 and this word rock in Matthew chapter 16, 18 is none other than Jesus. Are you listening to me, my brothers and sisters? You have to choose to build your life, build it on the word of God. Because when the adversities of life are coming your way, and they will come sooner or later because you have chosen 
to follow Jesus and Jesus only. You have chosen not to build your life on philosophy. You have chosen not to build your life on a document other than the word of God. And this rock is none other than Jesus Christ. The church is built on Jesus and not Peter or anybody else who may try to manipulate and miseducate you in trying to get you to build your life on something other than the word of God. Let's look in the book of Psalms. Psalm, let me tarry just a little before we actually delve into the book of Revelation. I want to lay this foundation because it is critical that we understand that we must build our lives on the church, on, on Jesus, who has called you the church. In the book of Psalms, if you have your Bible, go to Psalms. Psalms 119, and we want to look at verse 105. Psalms 119. Listen what the Bible says. The Bible says in Psalms 119, verse 105, thy word, the psalmist says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible talks about the word of God. He uses symbolic terms. In David's time, they used to have a lantern and that lantern was put lowly close to the ground to illuminate the pathway of the walker. So he would be able to walk without stumbling or falling into a ditch or what have you. But the word functions as a light to the mind. We should follow Jesus and Jesus only. Let me share another verse with you from the same book, Psalms 95. Psalms 95 and verse 1. And then I'm going to have to move on. Time is of essence. The Bible says in Psalms 95 and verse 1. Listen what the Bible says. He says here, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Who is the author of your salvation? None other than Jesus Christ himself. And I can go on and on and show you scripture after scripture that your life should be built upon the word of God. And that word is none other than Jesus. The Bible says in first, I mean, John chapter one, verses one through three, the word. And then in verse 14 of John chapter one in verse 14, that rock became Jesus. The word became flesh, my brothers and sisters. And Jesus says, he that would hear his word and choose to obey his word, he will liken that person and to a wise person who has built his life upon a rock. But let's move on. Question. This mighty angel had a little book or a scroll in his hand. What about it? What about this little book? This little book. For this book was mentioned at least four times in 11 verses of the book of Revelation. The verses in chapter 10 of Revelation, chapter two, the little book is mentioned. And verse eight of 10, the little book is mentioned. In verse nine and 10, the book is mentioned. Now listen, once again, it was mentioned four times as we mentioned in the book of Revelation, the number four is symbolic or universal. And as you know, in Revelation chapter seven, listen to me very carefully. Let's go there so you can see it for yourself. In the book of Revelation chapter seven, you will discover in Revelation is talked about four angels holding back the four winds of destruction. 
So form is my point is universal. So then this little book that is mentioned in chapter 10 of the book of Revelation must go to all of the world. This little book has a message that must be disseminated to every creature, every person on the earth. And the reason I know that is because that's what the Bible says. Okay? So then, number seven means completeness, as you can see on the screen. It is a message extend to the end of time. The book, Acts of the Apostles, page 585. This little book is a book of prophecy. It's, it's a book that is open, which means in an implication, it was closed at one time. The book was sealed or closed. And as you know, the little book, this little book represent the book of Daniel. Daniel had been instructed to shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end based on Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. This book was sealed until the time of the end. And what we mean by the time of the end, we mean some future time from Daniel's day that this book would be sealed, a certain part of it, until the time of the end. Let's move on. Listen now. The unsealing of this little book was the message in relation to time. Daniel 12, verse 9 says, and he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are sealed or closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now note, there will be a time when the book will be open. This admonition applies to the part of Daniel's prophecy that deals with the last days, especially the time element of the 2300 days, chapter 8 and verse 14. Consequently, the present chapter focuses upon the time when the proclamation, this is Revelation chapter 10, verses 6 and 7, was made. That is, during the years somewhere around 1840 to 1848. Now, let me try to help you to see that. When we deal with the number seven means completeness and totality. We have here a picture of Jesus in the very first chapter of Revelation walking among the seven golden candlesticks. Remember we said that seven means totality or completeness. The point that I want to make here is Jesus has promised his church his group of people who have responded to him that he will always be with them, whether we are collectively together or whether or not we are individually by ourselves. Jesus Christ has promised you and he has promised me that he will never forsake us, nor will he ever leave us. So Jesus has always and always will be connected to his church. He is the head of his church and he is the leader of his church. Are you listening to me, my brothers and my sisters? So we have here, we have here in the picture to my far left, maybe to your far right, if you're looking at the screen even behind me, you have the first church of Ephesus at the bottom here, Ephesus. Ephesus is the first church. It is the apostolic church, and it covers a period of time 
from 31 AD to 100 AD. So when you're talking about Revelation chapter 10, you're going to get in the book talking about the seven trumpets. And so we are talking about time. But if you go through the seven churches, you will end up with Laodicea somewhere around 1844. And as you know, Ephesus means uh, a love, first love. The church was in love with Jesus. The church was obedient to Jesus. The church carried the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the known world of the first century. They were very faithful. But as you know, as we progress through history, you know from your study of Revelation, the church has gone through many phases. All the way down to around 1798, which is a key date in history where the little horn received a powerful blow by the general birth, general of birth earth of Napoleon who captured the Pope and devastated the Roman Catholic Church in 1798, bringing a deadly blow to the little horn. But my point is, during the Church of Philadelphia, I'm sorry, yes, and during the Church of Philadelphia and going back to Sardis, 1517, you had a reformation that led up to 1798. But my point is, as we go through history, understanding some of the things that has happened to the church of a living God, you will know we are living in the time of the Laodicean church. And it means that we are lukewarm. We are not cold and we are not hot, but we are lukewarm. So I wanted to bring that point out because in Revelation chapter 10, you're talking about the seven trumpets. And as you know, I illustrated by saying in the first century, you had the seven cold golden candlesticks. And then in Revelation, you have the seven seals. Revelation, you have the seven angels. But here we are talking about the seven trumpets according to Revelation chapter 10. Now listen what it says here. It says here, we're talking about seven periods of time. Now we are talking about that seventh trumpet in Revelation chapter 10 and verse seven. It says, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants, the prophets. So here in Revelation chapter 10 and verse seven, we see something is about to happen according to the Bible. Something is about to happen. As we talked about uh, the seven trumpets, trumpet number one, as I brought out was apostolic time. And now we're talking about trumpet number two. And as you see, I'm going across seven, four, five, six, seven. We're having something going on in the earth around this time. What do we have going on? It's the great religious awakening. There was a revival interest in the second advent of Christ. Beginning somewhere around the 1800s, there was an international interdenominational and interdependent revival of the book of Daniel. There were a group of ministers from around the world who had an interest in this book of Revelation. There was a revival of this book. On every continent of the world, there was a particular prophecy that had captured the minds of preachers around the world. 
This prophecy was found in the book of Daniel, somewhere around chapter 8 and verse 14. I am not making this up, but it happened because God knew it would happen, so he wrote about it and put it in a book called Revelation. And this is a book that we should be studying in these last days. But let me move on, my friends. In the book of Daniel, chapter 8 and verse 14, it says, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. As these men read, and when they got to this particular verse, it puzzled them. What does it mean, 2,300 days? What is the sanctuary? During that time, they thought that the sanctuary was the world. Believe it or not, it is true. And I'm going to quote, and you can go and find this in the Great Controversy, page 300. And 49, and I'm quoting, in the Christian age, the earth was thought to be the sanctuary. It was a popular concept floating around the Christian community during the 1800s. And you can read the whole thing for yourself in the book, Great Controversy, page 349. What is the sanctuary? They thought it was the earth. Then they also thought that Jesus Christ would be coming back to this earth. They said Jesus is coming to the earth, so the earth must be cleansed by fire based on Revelation 29. This was the thinking of popular preachers all over the world at that time. Then they start doing some calculation from 1798 to 1844 would be 46 years. And so these people believe they had 46 years before the world would end. So they said, we must tell the the world that God is going to cleanse the world by fire. Who are they? Who are some of these ministers? Well, some of them, as we brought out in our research, was a Roman Catholic priest from Chile. His name was Emmanuel de Lagunza. And there were English and Scottish preachers such as Edward Irving, Henry Drummond, and Alexander Keith. But let me tell you, among these particular preachers, we had what we call a man by the name of William Miller. So then, let's go on here. Okay. And so we had here a man by the name of William Miller. It says here in the United States of America, the best known and authoritative on the teaching of this very concept was William Miller. He reasoned that the 23 day prophecy of Daniel pointed to the second coming of Jesus and he concluded that it would take place in eight 1844. Let me tell you, listen what it says here. In the 1800s, William Miller used to do a lot of preaching. But at this particular camp meeting, it is stated that there were at least a half a million people believing that Jesus was coming in 1844. All around the known world was stirred in 1844 talking about the second coming of Jesus from the book of Daniel. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 9 says, this little book was to be eaten. It was symbolic. It would be sweet as honey. 
This was what the angel said to John, take this book and eat it. It will be sweet to your stomach and bitter as well. But scholars say John was symbolic of the people of God during the time of William Miller. When they were hearing that Jesus was coming, many people sold their goods. Many people were preparing for Jesus' soon coming because people believed in this great preacher called William Miller. With intense interest, he had studied the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation and found great joy in knowing that Jesus would come in 1844. Where can you read some of this commentary, Evangelist Hollis? Well, if you go to the book, Great Controversy, page 344 by Ellen G. White, you will see. But on October the 22nd, 1844, Jesus did not come. Now their experience would be bitter and agonizing. People were faced with this great disappointment. Here was a man, William Miller, who had devoted his life on telling people that Jesus was coming in 1844 and it did not happen. This is history. This is not just Adventist history. Matter of fact, William Miller was not a Seventh-day Adventist at the time that he was preaching this message. People followed William Miller from different religious organizations. We have historical facts that preachers from all denominations felt the same way they had forecast and proclaimed that Jesus Christ would come back to this earth in 1844 and that the earth would be cleansed by fire. And so you have a whole lot of people who have been impacted by this particular proclamation of their gospel. And it was sweet and people rejoiced and people were expecting Jesus to come in 1844. But when he did not come, there was a great disappointment. The story of his coming was sweet to tell. But the experience was bitter as gall, rancor as a rotten apple, and people were hurt and they were disappointed. And so the name William Miller became harmful. Nobody wanted to hear the name William Miller. So we end it with a great disappointment. But ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, God is the good God. But there is a hidden truth behind this great disappointment. You say, what, Evangelist Hollis? What could be this hidden truth? Well, if you read Revelation chapter 11 and verse 1, the Bible says, and that was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, arise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Now the implication was, that the people were depressed, they were down, their spirits were low. And so God gives people hope. That's the thing I like about the God that we serve. God gives us hope in time of despair. And so God is speaking to the people. The angel or the messenger says to the people of God, Arise, 
The answer to the great disappointment lies in the temple of God, which is in heaven. That's Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19. If you have your Bible, turn with me. The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19, it says, and the temple of God was open in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there was what now? Lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hell. The temple of God was open. That is the answer. And not only that, it talks about this angel telling John to measure the temple. What do you mean? It's the only place that we know as Adventists that three issues were brought out in this particular text in the book of Revelation chapter 11. He says here in Revelation chapter 11, he says, verse one, he says, measure the temple of God. That's one, and measure the altar and them that worship therein. According to biblical scholars, he's making reference to the day of atonement, whereby all three issues here are recognized the day of atonement. And as I brought out, you see in the ark of God, his 10 commandments, the testament of God, the, that's the 10 commandments that were written with God's own finger. But I wanna bring out a point here, during the time of William Miller in the 1800s, as you know, a popular concept that God's Ten Commandments have been done away with. That's what some Protestant churches are saying, even to this very day. And then also you see the fourth commandment in the Ark of his Testament, God's Sabbath. So God has never abolished his Sabbath, but we have religious entities in the world who are saying that God's day of worship has been changed from Sabbath to Sunday. You see, my brothers and sisters, during the time of William Miller, we had a revival. We had an interest in the word of God. And you must remember that God has not forsaken his church. God is still moving in history, moving even in this very moment during this pandemic crisis that we are having in the world. God is still in charge. And in spite of all the difficulties and the hard times and the dark sayings that we see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is still being preached right now in the midst of all of this, conveying hope to people. God will supply your every need according to Philippians 4, 19. In spite of even if I have to go to a soup kitchen to get myself fed or what have you, God will supply our every need. I believe that with all of my heart. But like I said, in the book of Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19, we see the symbolic uh, saying through God telling the angel to measure the temple of God, the altar and the people who worship is indicative of the day of atonement according to Leviticus chapter 16. Let me move on. And as I brought out, I'm just a little ahead of myself, but that's okay. Why I measured the temple? What was the flaw in the temple? None other than people had the wrong concept the wrong concept of where, what was happening in the time of the end. In the time of the end, the sanctuary would be revealed. 
Are you listening to me? And so we find here that there were a great falling away. Some people went back to their churches, went back to their churches, but there were a faithful few like Ellen White, Hiram Edson, et cetera, who agonized with God, who prayed to God, who wanted God to explain to them what had happened during the great disappointment. And we have on the screen here, Hiram Edson in prayer meeting was explaining with fellow believers their disappointment. They said that that night they cried and they cried. They wept and wept until the sunrise. And that's quoting from Hiram Etson. And now after prayer meeting, Hiram Etson and one of his colleagues, Crozier, was going through a cornfield. Now, some people think that this is made up, but it's not true. There is a rationale behind the fact that they were going through a cornfield because they did not want to face the public. People were making mockery of them. Is it, has it come yet? And all this kind of remarks caused these men to take another way home. And so as they were going through a cornfield, the quote says, Hiram Edson and O.R.L. Crozier Crossing a field, he stopped and heaven seemed to open to his view. And he saw Jesus, our high priest, moving from the first to the second apartment of the heavenly sanctuary in fulfillment of Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. And so I put it here on the screen to show you, my brothers and sisters, that Jesus Christ moved from one part of the heavenly sanctuary to the second part of the heavenly sanctuary, indicating that judgment or the antipical day of atonement has started. That was the true interpretation of Daniel chapter eight and verse 14. My brothers and sisters, even to this very day, we are living in the antipical day of atonement. Listen, Jesus reveals his new work. Heaven seems to open to my view, Hiram Edson said, and I saw the most holy of the heavenly sanctuary. He saw Jesus moving from one particular uh, place in the heavenly sanctuary to the other. As I said, and I can't say it enough or overemphasize it, Jesus Christ has not forsaken his church. Jesus is still leading his church. Jesus says, follow me and you will not walk in darkness, but that you will have the light of life. My brothers and sisters, so then we have here in 1863, God formulating a church of prophecy. The remnant church of God came into existence I want you to know the Seventh-day Adventist Church was organized in 1863, and she is the remnant church of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Are you listening to what I am saying? Through the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Reformation is still going on. The Reformation will be brought to its conclusion Yes, my brothers and sisters, God has called us to continue the Reformation, to continue calling people to Jesus and being prepared for his soon coming. Yes, my brothers and sisters, it was just like in the time of Jesus. Before he left here, Jesus Christ spoke firmly to his disciples. He told them, that you were going to be scattered. He says, uh, the shepherd will be smitten and the sheep will be scattered. And he was quoting from the book of Zechariah, chapter 13 and verse six. And it was fulfilled on the night when 
Jesus was captured by the Roman government and given a farce of a triumph. And the disciples hid themselves afraid. But Jesus knew, he knew what was going to happen because he based his statements on the Bible. And so it was in the time of William Miller, right there in Revelation chapter 10, we see the symbolic experience when John was told to eat the book and it would be sweet and bitter. That was portraying God's people during the time of William Miller. It was sweet to hear Jesus coming again, but when he did not come, brothers and sisters, it brought about disappointment and people scattered and went back into their churches. But thank God there were a group of people who held on, who prayed, who prayed and asked God and agonized with God to give them light and God gave them light. And they formulated by the grace of God, his remnant church and the remnant church has an awesome responsibility. And that responsibility is to proclaim the three angels' messages to the world. So my brothers and sisters, I appeal to you to make Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior. I appeal to you to study the Bible like you've never studied it before. I appeal to you, my brothers and sisters, Pray and agonize with God for the latter rain. It's going to take the Holy Ghost and an understanding of your mission and your purpose for being here on the earth. I know right now the churches are disembobulated because of COVID-19. And sure, you should be careful about crowds and who you a common contact with. I would suggest to you to follow the mandate of the government by wearing a mask, washing your hands, practicing social distancing. But at the same time, brothers and sisters, I've seen people out there knocking on doors, trying to get people to go to the polls to vote. And I said to myself, if people will take a chance on catching COVID-19 by doing some political tests, what kind of faith we should have? I'm not afraid of COVID-19. I think God will protect me, but I'm not being foolish, but I'm not going to let anybody outdo me. I'm going to still some way, somehow get this gospel out through technology, through dispersing literature in a plastic bag or what have you. I'm still going to stay on the battlefield for my Lord. And if I have to learn this Bible through technology, and we have that on Wednesday night prayer meeting, we have Dr. Johnson explaining what I'm talking about right now. And you should tune in to prayer meeting. If you want to know how to tune in to prayer meeting, call our clerk, Sister Edwards, and she will give you the link to hook up to prayer meeting. Not only will you hear the word being explained, you can see it as well. And hopefully as a result of us learning more about God, there is a reverential respect for the word of God. As it was brought out in our Sabbath school, the word of God brings light to the mind an understanding to your spirit that Jesus is soon to come, but he cannot come until the three angels' messages have been disseminated into every hamlet, every village, every town, and every continent on the globe. Yes, my brothers and sisters, God loves you. I love you at as well. And I pray God that we all will love God enough to do his will. Yes, there is a bittersweet experience, but Jesus is going to come one day and it's going to be sweet and sweeter. 
Yes, my friends, hang in there. God bless you and may God keep you. Amen. That's the end.